So, great. Our next speaker is Evelyn Towns from Park. So, um, thanks a lot. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I really see my time here as uh, doing a lot of learning about the set of issues, but uh, I did want to make a few remarks at this point. Um, so, I wanted to begin by saying, you know, my exploration of, of issues related to the topics of the workshop have been, um, in some respects, uh, quite recent, and in other respects, I've watched how certain biases, uh, both racial biases, sexism, have become embedded in both the content of a wide range of algorithm-based systems um, and the culture and communities in which that work has been done. So just to date myself, when I learned to code and work as a software engineer uh, developing applications in the early 1970s through the mid-1980s, I was usually the only African-American woman, uh, only African-American and one of the few women in my classes and in the companies where I worked. And these environments were certainly dominated by white men, many who I viewed as immature and socially uncomfortable with the presence of women and especially with the presence of women, of women and men of color. And it was a world where the culture actually mirrored the kind of command control structure that was embedded in the code that we produced. Um, and as that culture, I watched as that culture kind of morphed into the Silicon Valley world we know today where corporate workplaces are more like engineering school campuses. Um, and the diversity of the workforce certainly has changed. It's more international for one, but yet the presence of African Americans and Latinos as engineers and members of the technical staff remain abysmally low. So I just wanted to show you to begin with just one. Um, okay, then do I know how to use this? Not sure. Okay, just one set of data from the Google 2019 uh, diversity report. I hope it's very hard to see. Can you see it at all? Right, you can't even see it from the front row. Okay, let me. I'll tell you. So right here is 2019. This this is what you get when you make your slice in the plane. Right? So these slides are going to be terrible, that's all I can say. Um, so um, the report for the first time, 2019 Google Diversity Report, um, included data from employees who were differently abled as well as those who are LGBTQ. And what it shows is a slight increase in tech hires for females from 24.6% of their workforce in 2017 to 25.7%. <laughs> this year, yeah, huge, right? Uh, for the tech hires for blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans, the numbers are 4.8% of the tech work workforce for blacks, 6.8% of the tech workforce for Latinos, and 1.1% for Native Americans. And the tech hires of African American females increased to 2.2%, which they're very proud of. Um, to state the obvious, in most respects, Google remains a kind of monoculture where the social implications of tools they develop are understudied, but clearly designed to reflect the values and interests of one segment of our population. So as I said, um, I'm here to sort of engage with you all in, in the conversation and learn more about especially the algorithm-based work, how it actually um, gets done. So I just want to focus on really um, two points um, where I question how biomedicine still reflects past understandings of race, number one. And number two, it assumes that, assumes that these past uh, understandings, I want to make the, the, the point that they cannot be easily undone. So um, one question I was going to ask at the end of the last session is to say something I think is really important for all of us to understand. The entire um, US-based medical system is deeply, inescapably dependent on certain presumptions about race, racial difference, and biological differences between human groups. And it has been so since at least the 17th century. So the examples that Dorothy gave of Cartwright, uh, who talked about drapetomania, black people running away, that kind of 
attitude and presumption of difference goes forward in time. And there is no time that at least historians have been able to document when that was not the case. When the presumption of biological difference between groups in the U.S. was not the presumption of American medical people. Has, we don't know when that time was. So I think for all of us trying to do work on sort of thinking about the biases built in, we have to start from that premise. They are there. They are everywhere. And a lot of that is something that I think we, as I said, I think we have to pay attention to. So as you, as you, what I want to turn to now is the ways in which some of the classifications and racial categories have been used in medicine. I just want to give one example. I mean, as you well know, classification systems have a long history. They're part of um, the scientific understanding of both peoples and societies. And as uh, many people have noted, there have been extensive histories written about how racial classification emerged in the 18th and 19th centuries in North America as a paradigm of differentiation that would support the exclusion of certain groups from social and political life. And today, as in the past, um, library and information science organization systems have used uh, in their subject catalogs and classification systems that they create, uh, they've played an important part of understanding the landscape of how information and now sort of disciplines of information science uh, have inherited and continue uh, and contribute to, I should say, certain kinds of bias practices in their system designs, especially on the web. So I just want to add to some of the previous speakers' uh, comments about the problems associated with the use of concepts of biological um, race. So what I want to turn to is that in the late 1990s, um, historians of medicine, bioethicists, uh, others, question how race and ethnicity were defined in the Medline uh, database. So some of you may know, I'm sure most of you know if you've tried to download any sort of biomedical life sciences articles, it's the US National Library of Medicine. It's their premier bibliographic database that contains more than 25 million references to the journal articles in the life sciences and biomedicine. The database is indexed with National Library of Medicine medical subject headings called the MESH. Um, and so some historians of medicine, uh, certainly in some of the folks I've been working with for a long time, we wanted to understand how you could use it, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Medline database to trace the use of racial categories in cataloging and indexing uh, biomedical articles over time. And we questioned whether and how and if older and strictly typological concepts of race, those are based on the notion of biological differences, and how that and how issues of ethnicity were used in Medline, um, as the, if, if they were used in the same way as the precursor to Medline, which was called Index Medicus, uh, had used those terms. So we know that Medline has to organize thousands of topics into an indexing system to strike a balance between that old system that they had, which was absolutely riven with categories of, of race, and current interests. So in the um, race workshop that I convened at MIT and Harvard for about 15 years, our motley crew of historians, physicians, biologists, sociologists, feminists, and STS scholars were constantly trying to tease apart what was happening in the Medline system and really try to see if we could use it to, to build our timelines about how racial concepts maybe had changed over time in the biomedical and life sciences disciplines. And whether or not discredited racial terms were being used in papers that were really focused on uh, human genetic variation in the age of genomics. Was all that, how was that past set of categories being carried forward is the kind of questions that we've been um, asking. So um, this is just one, the front page from the Medline um, site. And so uh, Pam Sankar, Sankar in uh, 2003 wrote this article um, on um, Medline definitions of race and ethnicity and their application to genetic research. Uh, Sankar's a bioethicist, and she showed how these categories uh, were used to index the articles using the medical uh, subject headings. Um, and she showed that they were, many of them were decades old and inconsistent. So this is published in 
2003. So when she did a search for race in MeSH, it returned racial stocks, right? Um, which MeSH defined as, quote, major living subspecies of man differentiated by genetic and physical characteristics. So the notion that, that races are subspecies, right there front and center. It listed four races, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid, and Australoid. And defined each of the first three as a major racial group determined, distinguished according to physical features. I'm going to keep saying this. It's 2003. So uh, what was interesting um, also is that um, when, while the mesh sort of distinguished between uh, race, racial stocks, and ethnic groups, the former, uh, that is racial stocks, were designated for indexing articles that concerned a population's physical characteristics, whereas the, the latter indicated articles about what they called cultural, psychological, social, sociological, or ethnological aspects. No further information was provided. And those distinctions were allowed to stand. And as I said, she conducted this in, in 2002 and then in 2003, found that the indexers applied the distinction between racial stocks and ethnic groups so inconsistently that in some categories, as many as 30% of the articles conforming to racial stock criteria were instead indexed to something called ethnic groups. So what she said in this article is she concluded that the mesh per, um, indexing needed to be reconsidered and reviewed and taken and what needed to leave that system were these old terms like Caucasoid, Mongoloid and all of those because they were outmoded, they came from a kind of colonialist legacy and needed to be um, uh, uh, really seriously reviewed. In response, the National Library of Medicine admitted that they were outmoded and they promised to make uh, uh, substantial revisions and produce new notes that went along with the categories. But uh, they also noted uh, in that quote, race is an unscientific concept. Nonetheless, even a cursory review of current literature shows that studies in which groups are described by implied or explicit racial characteristics continue to be published and to contribute to a deeper understanding of human biology. This, that sentence has many pieces <laughs> that need to be taken apart. Uh, and they, they close by saying, we hope that the revised treatment of racial and ethnic groups in the 2004 edition of MeSH will remove offensive terminology, but will still allow the indexers to describe topics that are discussed in the literature indexed in Medline. Um, so um, the scope notes, which are these notes that are shown alongside of the, when you do a search, was, were first developed to give the indexers an aid to help them understand how they could sort, right? You know, how to put things in various buckets. But they noted um, in one of the discussions of this, this switch that was happening around 2003, 2004, that they argued that w once Medline became a free public database, that it had, become un it had come under increasing public scrutiny. Because researchers and the public did not understand why there were certain categories being used to describe racial groups and ethnic groups. Um, and that really actually made them, that was actually the push, not a letter from a bioethicist, but that was the push to get them to rethink how they were doing this. I think it's really interesting that they say race is an unscientific concept, but it's going to deepen our understanding of human biology. Um, so. So I made only a brief, really brief foray into what is happening to Medline today. I just really did a short check. And they have a new product called uh, Mesh on Demand. Um, and um, uh, he, I'm just going to show you a few um, screenshots. So I put in race. That was just yesterday. Continental, it comes up with continental population groups. Uh, these are groups of individuals whose putative ancestry is from native continental populations based on similarities in physical characteristics, uh, physical appearance. Right? And then they have these interterms race and racial stocks. Not gone anywhere. 
Then if you search on continental population groups, you get groups of individuals whose putative ancestry is from native continental populations based on similarities in physical appearance. So uh, I, you know, uh, we can talk about this. Uh, but as you can see, it's not clear how much more helpful <laughs> this is. <laughs> <laughs> For those of us who use it almost weekly or daily, this, this, is, this is absurd. Um, and so um, I think, let me see which one, other ones I have. So here's a screenshot, if you can see this one. It has the top one is European uh, continental ancestry. These are individuals whose ancestral origins are in the continent of Europe. Then it, you could also, they could have also put that in the bucket called white, which are an ethnic group of putative Caucasoid origin. Did the people who are white know that? <laughs> um, then if you put in Caucasoid race, it's a group distinguished by classification according to physical features. This group, also called Europoid, centers around the Mediterranean Sea but includes other parts of Europe other parts of Europe, and they took those definitions from, uh, in one of them, uh, the American Heritage Dictionary Second College Edition. From 1972? <laughs> no. That was, oh, okay. That's the uh, Dictionary of Anthropology, 1972. Okay. When it says entry terms, is that meaning that? That's like the term you put in to search for, and it comes up with a list of articles referred to that, that keyword, sort of. So if I want articles on race, I put in race, and I get the set of, a set of articles that they've deemed have that as a major keyword in the abstract, which they use to sort it. Yeah. Oh, that was good. OK. Oh, well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you more. Did I? The wire that connects to your computer. Just jiggle it for Help is on the way. Help is on the way. OK, uh, but let me, um, oh, thank you. Oh, no. She's, I'm sorry, it's me. It's me. It's, it's not the machine. It's really me. Thank you. It's this one. Yes, right. OK, but you can still search for Negroid. And additional terms that would come up uh, with that are, are seen right here on the side. Humans, I beg your pardon? Full-text retrieval? No, not quite. Uh, there are ways you can get the full text, though. It takes you a few places. Uh, her, uh, humans, African continental ancestry group, European continental ancestry group. It comes up with articles related to genetic homogeneity among the Negroid and Arab tribes of the Sudan, study of 30 DNA markers in three southern African populations. So Negroid gets you to those kind of articles. Okay. Uh, Mongoloid similarly refers to humans, uh, Asian continental ancestry group, and also for folks who have um, for information about Down syndrome. <coughs> Mongoloid is a very old and discredited term to describe people with um, uh, Down syndrome. And then Caucasoid, again, European continental ancestry group, and it goes from everything from um, Evaluation of the relative contribution of Caucasoid and Mongoloid components in the formation of ethnic groups to new classifications of um, alleles in rheumatoid arthritis susceptibility. So I, I think I made my point that these whole terms that carry very different meanings historically and quote unquote biologically are still embedded in this system. How you, the problem they faced was how you get it out. And I think it's very clear from a couple of people that I've talked to that they don't know how to get it out right now. And that is a very serious problem for them. And then and when you go into the new mesh on demand, the last thing you see is mesh on demand uh, suggested mesh vocabulary are machine generated by MTI. I don't know who MTI is. And do not reflect any human Review. MTI may recommend mesh terms not expi explicitly found in the text. So they actually, their machine learning program actually might be catching those older terms up because that's what's built in 
for it to do because I can't imagine I if I would you know looking for something contemporary I wouldn't put in Negroid I mean I, that's it seems that the, that the system is doing that in part referencing um, that so the question for them is um, what to do about um, the new systems uh, machine generated response uh, and, and it's not I'm not objecting to the problem of a machine generated response in my view, the problem is that when you're searching on issues on, for topics related to race and ethnicity, the database is already riven with misapplication of these terms and thus at best reflects the absence of any kind of consensus on the use of race or definitions of race uh, in biomedicine and life sciences uh, research. And now the confusion is embedded in the machine learning system. And that's what I think is embedded, a certain kind of confusion that constantly, depending on the kind of search you're doing, that goes back and forth between something that we think of as some biological and physical characteristics and then something that's referenced and used race in a very different way. But it's very hard unless you think about that part of the problem to disaggregate what you get. Yes, Duena. I just looked up MTI. Yeah. And it's from the National um, Libraries of, Medi of Medicine. It's a medical text indexer that combines um, the index section in the library, uh, that, their expertise in natural language processing to curate the biomedical literature more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Do you think they're working? OK. Um, so this my, <laughs> so my, my, my point about this is that first, there's, um, there's no robust process available to get public input into changing the MeSH terms. Medline is a publicly funded um, system. Um, they say you can write in and if you have problems or you want different MeSH terms that they will collect your ideas and subject it to some kind of review which they do not describe and you have no idea if the, how and when the input might change. Um, and it seems that the focus is really getting the data into the system without considering, and particularly in the use of these categories, what they reflect about the very definitions that they're trying to give back to people as they actually do the searches. So, I mean, there's much, much, much more work to be done. And um, my students have been largely working in the past with Index Medicus, which is much, you know, in, in a way, much more consistent in its use of older typological biologically based racial categories than the current system. And my point is that the current system is really a confused system, much more so than the older one was. And so I, I, so I think there's, there's a lot more to do. And it's very clear there's no common language that they can draw upon. Most fields don't present very clearly guidelines for this, though more of the journals are doing so. But Anyway, that's, uh, and so I, I, when I got to the bottom line and I saw that this is now no human review, I thought, well, okay, I don't know how we get race out of this. Our older notions of race are specific kinds of, of, of uses of race that are problematic. Um, so that's the point. There's uh, little opportunity at this point to, to really discuss, and I think we do need to discuss, the way to disaggregate these older race uh, concepts from new con conceptions of human um, variation. And um, one last thing I wanted to say when I was also looking around for uh, uh, what I wanted to talk about today, I was going to review uh, Latanya Sweeney's uh, well cited paper on, on privacy and um, databases and, uh, uh, and algorithms. But when I, when I was going through that journal, I decided to look at all the articles in that issue, and I found really a very interesting article about encouraging IT usage in future healthcare. This is May 2013. Um, and the author was arguing about how technology could act as a change agent for healthcare. I just thought her description of what she envisioned is an interesting one for us to discuss. She said, um, imagine the day when an elderly woman in India feels ill. At birth, a genetic code has been entered into her medical record. Since birth, she has been able to record a complete history of time and location-based measurements of her physiological features, for example, temperature, blood pressure, height, and weight and of her environment, for example, air and water quality, interactions with people. Ubiquitous sensor networks would collect this information. And today she might record this information using her cell phone and store it in the cloud. 
She also might be illiterate, but still be able to manage this information with speech input. And these recordings are part of her personal medical record, which also includes past interactions with health and wellness professionals, professionals such as diagnoses, intervention treatments, and medical test results. She contacts her doctor. They meet in cyberspace. Today, this real-time communication could be virtual, though it could be through avatars uh, on a, a wall-sized touch display in her home where there will be a projection of something that might or not might or might not be a real doctor. Um, for also, she could demonstrate the pain she gets in moving her body in certain ways. She can demonstrate the pain. She can show the location and pattern of rashes. Her doctor can explain the meaning of a test result by zooming in on her medical image or by replaying a videograph. And tomorrow, the doctor might be able to palpate the arm, the sore arm in investigating the problem. I mean, I can't. Even just the beginning of this scenario, there's so many places where we know that there are problems in the work to do to accomplish what she imagines. For example, there's also been some work on how um, uh, images of projected of rashes on different skin colors are very hard for people to analyze and diagnose disease from. So there's another place where the skin colors what the rashes look like. If you look at old medical textbooks, you see a lot of this. And you see, again, this, uh, it's a racialized story. She talks about the doctor being able to change the drugs that the person has, has been given. Well, we also know that uh, pharmacogenomics has explicitly been a race-based project. So all the way through the imagined paradise future of having all the data you could possibly want, about uh, an individual's health and be able to, to manage it uh, would be still compromised by these older notions of race if we don't address them. And the very last point uh, they make is um, uh, that she, um, her doctor can determine the most appropriate treatment for her. A treatment for an elderly Indian woman will be based on populations more similar to her rather than on, say, middle-aged male Caucasians who grew up in the United States. So the goal here is to, um, as they say, uh, create, uh, and again, this is a, a sentence that I was deeply struck by, a model of the human, a multi-resolution, multi-scale, many-dimensional, highly parameterized computation model of a human body. It relies on data and processing capability to simulate all systems of the human and their interactions from the molecular level to the systems level and any what if is possible. Jonathan Katz. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Katz. Khan. 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 Sorry. My glasses are scratched. Uh, oh, you need a microphone. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, my glasses what? got scratched. I'm not using this. Okay. So uh, Jonathan Khan from Mitchell Hanlon's um, uh, School of Law. And yes, I'll be in in a month. I'll be joining the faculty at Northeastern. Very. Where, where I will have wonderful new colleagues. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, I deliberately had a salad for lunch instead of a burger so I can try to keep up my energy level here. Um, so uh, what I'd like to talk about is, um, is essentially sort of the, the ideology of algorithms as opposed to algorithms as a tool, um, specifically um, in the space of something known as uh, behavioral realism and its approaches to the law. Um, behavioral realism um, is a sort of liberal response, uh, if you will, to the more conservative law and economics movement. And the idea behind it is um, trying to use uh, insights from cognitive um, and neuropsychology uh, to inform the law, um, particularly uh, and prominently in the area of uh, anti-discrimination law, equal protection law, where it's been uh, propon pro um, uh, propounded by, the, uh, by its sort of liberal exponents as a, as a way of trying to break through kind of the dead end of equal protection law that we're kind of faced with uh, these days. Um, it's premised on the idea that, uh, 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 that implicit bias is a pervasive, continuing, endemic phenomenon, but that explicit bias is something that's largely a phenomenon of the past, which I think 
you know, recent years sort of call into question. Um, and but also who's uh, again sort of the leading exponents to say things like you know America is not today a racist nation, right? That it's a problem of implicit bias, not racism. Um, and so um, I, I had a book come out last year, uh, Race on the Brain, which is sort of an extended critique of this whole enterprise. Uh, but today in particular, um, I want to focus on uh, uh, what I call uh, sort of the uh, the technophilia of this approach in behavioral re realism and specifically uh, the, idea, the idea how in certain areas uh, the, this combination of uh, uh, cognitive psychology and law using the concept or what I would again sort of call the ideology of, of, of algorithms or technophilia um, to sort of inform its, its approach in very, very problematic ways. Um, uh, so um, discussing the emergence of modern uh, behavioral psychology uh, philosopher Tasman Shaw notes that in 1971, its founding father, or among its founding fathers, B.F. Skinner, uh, quote, expressed the hope that the vast humanly created problems facing our beautiful planet, you know, famine, war, threat of nuclear holocaust, uh, could all be solved by, quote, new technologies of behavior, right? So the idea of this technical fix to complex social and legal problems holds a great appeal. Right. It is neat, it is clean, it's seemingly objective, and powerfully authoritative. Behavioral realism's technical fix turns racism into a function of measurement and subordinates legal and political judgment to scientific expertise. To the degree that such subordination comes to dominate strategies of anti-racist action, it amounts, in effect, to outsourcing the hard public and democratic work of addressing in injustice to private, often corporate, technocrats. Numerous critiques of the neoliberal turn in American politics since the 1980s have decried the commodification of, en of everything. Similarly, my critique of behavioral realism takes issue with its urge to measure everything. There is, of course, a connection between the two, not only in the impulse towards quantification, but also in the fact that diversity management and related applications of behavioral realism have become big business. Behavioral realism is deeply grounded in technologies of measurement, from the millisecond response calculations of an implicit association test to the glowing images of an fMRI measuring purported responses to racially coded stimuli. Behavioral realism reduces rep racism to a metric phenomenon, real or meaningful only to the extent that it can be measured by technological apparatuses devised, implemented, assessed by experts. Measuring requires quantification of bias, and quantification is seductive because of the ways in which it simplifies knowledge and facilitates decision making. Anthropologist Sally Mary cautions, however, that, quote, counting things require making them comparable, which means they are in inevitably stripped of their context, history, and meaning. So social psychologists love to measure prejudice. A review of the, I, I took a look at this book called The, the Handbook of Multicultural Measures, all right? came out a few years ago. And it evaluated no fewer than 37 purported measures of, pre of prejudice, you know, tools that are out there. Surveys, galvanic skin response, fMRIs, IATs, all that stuff, right? You know, it's always trying to measure, 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 measure. Each measure surely has its own particular merits, but they cumulatively test testify to a near fetishization of technologies of measurement as a foundation for so social psychological approaches to bias. We see this fascination with measurement foregrounded in the very title of Jerry Kang and Mazarin Banerjee's, two, two sort of leading proponents, one psychologist, one uh, legal scholar of, of, this, uh, of behavioral realism. And the title of this article they had come out about a decade ago called Fair Measures, right? A Behavioral Realist Approach to Affirmative Action. The contemporary fascination with measuring racism harks back eerily to the 19th century scientific obsession with measuring all aspects of the black body to establish biological racial difference. This is not to say that empirical research into the dynamics of implicit prejudice is unwarranted or will necessarily yield poor data. Rather, it is to point up the tendency in behavioral realism, despite the equivocal caveats repeatedly put out there by various of its practitioners, that science is not a magic bullet, 
bullet or to claim that such empirical work should have, but, but rather that they claim, uh, the concern is with the claim that such, uh, th that they claim that such empirical work should have pride of place in establishing legal baselines for, for finding, establishing discrimination and in crafting legal and policy responses to such findings. Always there is the search for, quote, objective evidence something concrete, measurable, quantifiable, the implication being that other more sociologically or historically informed qualitative interpretive methods of understanding or addressing racism should take a backseat to the science. Behavioral realists embrace scientific authority, authority largely in the name of providing a counterweight to a more, to the more conservative quantitative work of law and economic scholars, using the tools of the enemy against him, so to speak. Uh, as again, as Jerry Kang, for example, sees behavioral realism as so powerful precisely because it is grounded, quote, in those rigorous and quantitative techniques that the right demanded when dismissing di victim accounts about discrimination as a mere anecdote, unquote. When one thinks about the status of scientific authority in the realm of legal discourse, one usually thinks, uh, for us, us lawyer types, right, of, uh, of evidentiary issues raised by the Supreme Court in a case called Daubert versus Merrill, Pharma Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals, uh, which set forth the conditions under which expert evidence will be admitted at trial as relevant or reliable. Um, yet, as Sheila Jasanoff notes, quote, since the early years of industrialization, belief has grown in legal circles that scientific evidence is one of the most reliable kinds of evidence and that science can deliver insights into matters otherwise hidden from judicial inquiry. It's part of its appeal, right? The hope, she continues, though, is that technology, through its me mechanical reproducibility, will be impervious to context, right? That connects back to Sally Mary's idea of it stripping things of their context, and will provide unbiased and reliable evidence about the facts of the matter. Human actions, however, can never be entirely ruled out of the picture in the production of evidence. So, Scientifically observed phenomenon, in other words, as, as, uh, as Nancy was pointing out earlier, do not speak for themselves, right? Um, uh, they are, to the contrary, for all practical purposes, unreadable unless they are made to speak with the aid, aid of specialized laboratory techniques, scientific evidence, expert testimony, all of which demand the work of trained professionals. Um, again, as Jasnoff puts it, quote, facts are not pure, unmediated renditions of an external reality whose objectivity is secured by a single transcendent scientific method. In producing scientific facts, especially on previously unstudied problems, scientists must engage in complex debates about the correctness of particular theories, experimental methods, experimental ex instrumental techniques, validation procedures, statistical analyses, and so forth. Like science, law and politics have their own institutional constraints and imperatives. Doing justice and promoting public welfare follow different processes and priorities. But the hope and the illusion that science and scientists can offer some sort of unmediated uh, access to objective truths about social life pervades behavioral realism. Thus, behavioral realism's embrace of measurement, like its acceptance of the conservative framing of affirmative action, which is a whole separate discussion, provides a foundation for a broader and more problematic elevation of quantitative methods of analysis over qualitative and the attendant subordination of legal to scientific authority. And not just legal authority, but more sort of democratic forms of public uh, discourse, uh, de political discourse. We see this powerfully articulated in Kang and Banerjee's assertion that, quote, the me this is a slightly extended quote, but bear with me, the methodology of behavioral realism forces the law to confront an increasingly accurate description of human decision making and behavior as provided by the social, biological, and physical sciences. Behavioral realism identifies naive theories of human behavior latent in the law and legal institutions, and then juxtaposes these theories against the best scientific knowledge available to expose gaps between assumptions embedded in law and reality described by science. 
When behavioral realism identifies a substantial gap, the law should be changed to comport with science. This statement is significant not simply because it is uttered by two leading proponents of behavioral realism, but also because it so clearly sets forth the basic premise upon of uh, central to so many behavioral realists, that the authority of science should be elevated over that of the law in engaging issues of race and racism in American society. The basic frame here is that science can fix the law make it better, bring it more in accord with reality, if only science is allowed to lead the way. This, reflect, this frame reflects, again, what Jasanoff characterized as the signal disenchantment of contemporary America with the law's capacity to resolve the manifold technical disputes of modernity and a concomitant embrace of the imagined clarity, certainty, and rationality of science. Similarly, it echoes Sally Mary's observation that the move towards empirical evidence-based governance, quote, removes responsibility from judicial and political decision makers to the experts in quantification who develop and implement measurement systems. What does it mean as a practical matter to say that the law should be made to comport with science? This is a way of saying that science can see things about racism that the law cannot. That the data of behavioral realism are superior to legal understandings of racism that draw upon interpretive understandings of history, culture, and society. Behavioral realism's elevation of scientific authority over legal authority is further premised on a problematically stark separation between the two. Right, the, the idea that instead of them sort of mutually informing and working together, it really is sort of like one following the other. Um, and that this, by the way, you know, I'm not talking, I'm not meaning to science bash here in any, res in any means. I, you know, I'm talking about putting two different re regimes of authoritative discourse into a more productive dialogue with each other. Right? Racism, however, needs to be understood only secondarily as an empirical phenomenon measured by IATs or fMRIs. It is first and foremost a function of context, meaning, and power. Measurement necessarily must be secondary because we must employ qualitative knowledge to interpret or argue about what such measurements mean or what should just be measured in the first place. The technology is never transparent. This is not to say that technologies or measurements of racial attitudes are not real but rather that they are not pure. That is, they cannot meaningfully exist outside of a value-laden human enterprise, interpretive enterprises. We see this perhaps, all the, we see perhaps the ultimate subordination of legal to scientific authority in Kang's characterization of judicial strict scrutiny as a, quote, algorithm to be applied as a, quote, equal protection machine to detect concealed uh, to quote, detect concealed intent to harm minorities. Kang's characterization resonates eerily with a neuroscience, a recent neuroscience study that entered fMRI readings taken during the presentation of different type of stimuli into a machine learning algorithm to predict whether a, a particular individual undergoing an fMRI was viewing a black or a white face, an ultimate algorithmic construction of racial bias in which human judgment need not apply. Strict scrutiny is typically understood as a method of legal analysis invoked by judges when reviewing a legal classification based on what's known as a suspect category, such as race. Right. In these cases, judges require that the classification be narrowly tailored to serve a compelling state interest. That's basically what you know, the standard definition of strict scrutiny. An algorithm, of course, is a step-by-step -step means of solving a problem but its derivation and prime meaning comes from the solving of mathematical problems. Algorithms drive computer programs, not judges. But behavioral realists would have judges act like computers, or at least more like computers. Like their more conservative counterparts in law and economics, behavioral realists would take the judgment out of judging. The idea here is that if you have only the proper metric inputs, then the equal protection machine will provide a true empirically verifiable answer. But law is not math. Although empirical information may be very important for informing 
legal judgments, certain legal judgments, it in and of itself cannot make those judgments. Justice John Marshall Harlan's dissent in Poe versus Ullman in 1961, sort of precursor to the Griswold case on privacy, speaks an eloquent counterpoint to Kang's idea that strict scrutiny can or should be reduced to an algorithm. Due process, wrote Harlan, has not been reduced to any formula. Its content cannot be determined by reference to any code. The best that can be said is that through the course of this court's decisions, it has represented the balance which our nation, built upon postulates of respect for the liberty of the individual, has struck between that liberty and the demands of organized society. No formula could serve as a substitute in this area for judgment and restraint. Yet substituting a formula for judgment is precisely the implication of behavioral realism's fascination with measurement and the application of measurement to law through scientifically guided algorithms. One cannot say that the majority opinion in Plessy versus Ferguson, the separate but equal case, was somehow empirically incorrect or that Warren's opinion in Brown versus Board of Education was somehow empirically correct, at least not in the same way that you can talk about you know, Ptolemy's uh, idea of the Earth at the center of the, of the universe uh, you know, was empirically you know, incorrect relative to the Copernican system, right? Um, uh, uh, this is for the, for the simple reason, right, that, that the difference between Bl Brown and Plessy is an argument, right, an argument about the meaning of segregation. It's not, uh, it's not a sort of an empirically determinable, determinable phenomenon. Um, Although arguments about the meaning of segregation may be informed by empirical data, they cannot be resolved by it. A recent report by investigative journalists in ProPublica, which again, probably everybody is familiar with here, um, casts into high relief some of the pitfalls of ceding too much authority to supposedly objective, metrically based algorithms in the field of criminal justice. Titled Machine Bias, there's, a soft, there's software used across the country to predict future criminals and spies against blacks. The report examines the practical effects of risk, risk assessment algorithms that are used in courtrooms across the country to inform decisions about uh, you know, uh, every stage of the criminal justice process. And just sort of skipping through, cutting to the chase, right? They, they exhibit consistent and pervasive bias um, uh, against people of color who have you know, um, similarly situated, right? Put into the, fed into these algorithms and bias results. Um, so, um, and, and those, are, those also, there have been other, obviously the whole theme of this, right? There have been many other studies showing similar kind of biases in other areas, you know, granting, you know, loans and employment and things of this sort. So the shortcomings of this algorithmic approach for bias assessment and management can be brought into further relief um, by science studies scholars' critiques of similar algorithmic approaches to other areas of risk assessment and management. Experts have frequently been baffled by public resistance to the acceptance of their pronouncements regarding a wide range of risks, typically in the fields, fields of health and environmental management. Uh, for instance, popular protests over GMOs or nuclear power, particularly prominent in, in European countries. Um, expert, um, the bafflement often takes the form of characterizing the public as suffering from some form of knowledge or understanding deficit. Um, that is, popular democratic resistance to the unquestioning acceptance of scientific authority is deemed as somehow irrational or ignorant on its face. The knowledge deficit model is based upon the assumption that expert forms of knowledge provide a sufficient basis for deciding the most important public policy questions. In this view, public perceptions and beliefs that run, that run counter to this expert knowledge provide unacceptable justifications for public policies. Instead, support of expert knowledge needs to be built through education and various public relations strategies. Tellingly, this public deficit model identifies the problem as exterior to the scientific enterprise. And we see this you know, in many areas, right? It's like the problem you know, that we're, you know, it's, it's, it's always somebody else's problem, right? Not our problem that we're not realizing what, what we want. Um, in proposing the scientific method of cognitive psychology and neuroscience as a basis for breaking through the impasse of current equal protection law, behavioral realists imply if only conservative jurists and policymakers know the facts as we can present them, then they would surely embrace racial amelioration through affirmative action and other related programs. 
That is, behavioral realists cast the legal community itself as suffering from a sort of knowledge or understanding deficit that can be remedied by embracing imperialist realists' scientific findings. Not only is this stance empirically questionable, but it also further subordinates legal to scientific authority in a manner that blurs the relation between normative and factual issues, as well as between legal and scientific questions. Just as the risk-benefit analysis of much of law and economics research often blurs the distinction between empirical questions of measurement and normative questions of what to measure and how to define risks and benefits in the first place, so too does behavioral realism's focus on gauging millisecond responses to an IAT or on reading an fMRI image obscure the antecedent normative questions of why we are measuring those outputs and how we define the meaning of the results. Yet Kang characterizes behavioral realism itself as an algorithm that he explicitly contrasts with the more common sense judgment of forms of judgment based on, again, so-called naive psychological theories, right? You know, law is naive, science is sophisticated. Privileging algorithms privileges experts. Experts are primarily accountable to other experts, not to judges and certainly not to naive citizens. Behavioral realism not only elevates scientific authority over legal authority, but it also elevates unaccountable experts over officers and citizens of a democratic polity. Its valorization of all things metric may thus ma marginalize interpretive legal authority, or just interpretive, just the interpretive enterprise itself, and broader democratic and the broader democratic impulses upon which it rests. Such lack of accountability tends to reinforce existing structures of power. As Frank Dobbin and Alexandra Kalev note in their review of the diversity management industry, the ones based, uh, or uh, in, in these particular programs, the programs based on psychological and behavioral interventions to reshape, reshape individual managers' attitudes generally fail. Right? They don't actually increase workplace diversity. Only programs with firm lines of responsibility and accountability show any sort of result. Similarly, many behavioral realist interventions in the legal system are targeted at changing judges' attitudes um, and ceding all authority to measure and interpret redress uh, and institutional re realism to um, behavioral uh, realist experts. So um, just in closing then, uh, uh, the basic idea here is, you know, uh, well, as I've just sort of said that, right, you know, we don't want to be reflexively ceding too much authority in this regard, um, trying to reconceptualize this relationship between scientific and legal and more democratic forms of authority, interpretive and quantitative, um, pushing towards more um, uh, a, a larger sort of progress, racial progress, right? One thing can be sure, right? No algorithm is going to, to get us there, right? It's going to be hard, messy, dirty political work, right? Which isn't to say algorithms are irrelevant, but they, um, they can't do the work for us. Right? Okay. That's even my, my pad was holding that thing, rolling up the whole time. Did you enjoy it for Rachel? Um, no. Okay. Harry? Okay. Here she is. Hello, she is. Harry and Harry, good to see you. Are you ready? Wonderful. Okay, so our our next speaker is Harriet Washington, author of Medical Apartheid and Infectious Madness, lecturer in bioethics at Columbia. Do you have slides? Yes, it's 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 pockets today. Good afternoon. I'm going to speak um, about a few issues. 
having to do with uh, race and IQ, or intelligence, take your pick. And um, not comprehensive, certainly. But there are a lot of questions that have gone unanswered when it comes to looking at the copious amount of data that um, strengthens and supports hereditarian agenda, and unfortunately also supports the response to hereditarian agenda. So um, I'm going to have a lot of slides here. I'll skip a lot of them. But if I skip one that you really want to discuss, just bring it up later during the panel. So um, evidence of absence. I actually am put in mind of a phrase that Robert Bullard, the father of environmental racism, put to me once when I told him I was concerned about the lacking NHANES data pertaining to um, African American um, reliance on subsistence fishing. A Johns Hopkins expert told me, we have data about Asians, but nothing about African Americans. And if we don't have the data, it doesn't exist. <laughs> and Butler said, evidence of, um, absence of evidence does not equate to evidence of absence. So um, just because data aren't there doesn't mean that they're not, they don't exist, and that they're certainly doesn't mean that they're not pertinent. I'm going to talk about a lot of pertinent data that we tend to um, ignore. Um, Hereditarians are an interesting bunch. They have been around for a very long time. I would argue they've been around as long as our country has been and probably before. Uh, these are people who initially had some quite data-free beliefs about African Americans that we still subscribe to today. African American intelligence, they said, was uh, genetically mediated, heritable, permanent, fixed, and color-coded. Not just African Americans, but Asians, whites, Native Americans, you could determine the average intelligence of these groups uh, because nature had helpfully cover coded them for us. One of the, they did a lot of talking about that. They present a lot of data about that. But one thing that they don't do much talking about is what is intelligence? And when I put the question to some researchers who have spent their entire careers refining our knowledge of the field, they didn't actually have any answers either. Uh, one researcher said to me, that's a, very, that's a good question, a very good question. Then he fell into silence. <laughs> Arthur Jensen, who had a great deal to say when he was at Harvard about the lower intelligence of African Americans, or as he put them, Negroes, and their causes and the effects for society, how we should treat them, knowing that they're lower in intelligence and always will be. He wrote about this quite extensively, but when asked to define intelligence, he said, Intelligence, like electricity, is easier to measure than to define. Well, this nonsensical little aphorism could be refuted by any high school student who could easily tell you electricity is a flow of electrons. <laughs> <laughs> but still, he's, he was revered and respected as an authority on the subject. So we don't really know what intelligence is. We actually, current thinking is that it's a collection of attributes. It's like being attractive. It's not just your skin color, or your hair color, or your height, or your figure. It's a combination of all these things, an emergent quality. And um, in, intelligence is something we don't have a finger on. We don't know what it is, but we're very, very assiduous about measuring it. And so we measure it with IQ, although they often speak of intelligence in measuring IQ. And what is IQ measuring? Well, Binet said it did not measure a person's um, general ability. It didn't predict who was going to be a good performer or a poor performer. Um, but we, t we ignore that. We treat IQ as if it is indeed a um, fixed, innate, genetically mediated measure of intelligence. But it's not. What IQ actually does measure, and measures fairly well, is achievement. How well you read or write, what your vocabulary is like. How well you handle numbers how well you do abstract reasoning. And these are all qualities very important for success in the Western world. Very important for success, and um, not so important for success other, other places in the world. Um, one researcher put it very succinctly. I really liked the way he put it. He said, IQ will tell you if you're going to be a good office worker. It won't tell you if you're going to be a good farmer. And yet we treat it as if it were a universal measure. Um, the hereditarians, of course, um, the book, The Bell Curve, came out what, almost 30 years ago now, but it still is a hereditarian Bible. It's espoused by a lot of people who've never, never cracked its covers, but believe fervently in it, and have been swayed by the charts, graphs, all the dense tables of data. All these things impress people. 
two Nobel Prizes, because several hereditarians are, are Nobel laureates. So, um, but they're impressed by um, numbers. And we've accepted IQ as a metric of intelligence. But these numbers are numbers that are not very well understood by a lot of people who read the books. <laughs> and perhaps not by all the people who write the books. And it's my opinion that Hernstein, the co-author of The Bell Curve, was the expert. And Charles Murray has made statements that lead me to question his understanding of genetics. Um, so we have this. And then we also have the opposition. People don't agree with it. Unfortunately, opposition consists of people who are playing the hereditarian's game a numbers game. They're debating the importance of the numbers. They're debating Spearman's G. They're debating all these relativistic and reductionist um, data without ever asking themselves, what do these data really mean? And what do they not mean? We have these reductionist blinders when we look at this data. And we're not asking questions we should be asking about the real um, factors inherent in intelligence. We also have a collective um, state of arithmophobia in this country where people are afraid of math. And that works to the hereditarian's advantage. No one, including me, is going to hold himself or herself up to ridicule by looking through the charts in the bell curve and essaying to criticize them. Most people can't. They don't really understand them. And, they're going, and many people will blithely accept them because it, they're actually in concert with what they secretly believe or want to believe. So this hereditarian tool arithmophobia is quite handy, and again, even the critics of hereditarians tend to play their game. I think that um, there's also the role of authority, which I'll say a bit about later if we have time, but uh, people like James Watson, who, um, James Watson, an interesting fellow, he wrote the bell curve in which he thoroughly maligned his um, rival, the head of the other lab, Rosalind Fisher, I'm sorry, Rosalind Franklin, and um, he shows his hoary mis uh, misogyny for decades. He wrote in the book in which he reinforced it. But about 10 years ago, he changed misogyny for racism. When he told um, UK newspapers that he was a hereditarian, he believed in an innate inferiority of black people. Uh, they were intellectually inferior. They should not be allowed to reproduce at the same rates. Um, they were never going to be able to improve them. Training won't improve them. Education won't improve them. And uh, he was stripped of most of his uh, titles, and, um, but allowed to keep a few until um, only last year, he opened his mouth again <laughs> and uh, refuted his recantation by saying, that's right, blacks are inferior, at which point they stripped him of everything. Also, there was a very interesting article around that point where um, Kari Stephenson, head of the DECO laboratories in Iceland, revealed that Watson had submitted a DNA sample as part of a project some, some years ago. When they analyzed it, they found that Watson had 16 times more genetic complement of African descent than the average European. That's right, he's black. Technically, <laughs> 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 he's an octoroon, <laughs> if we're going to look at the numbers. <laughs> one sixteenth African. So, um, one of the delicious ironies <laughs> of this. There, believe me, there are far more. But what's really interesting is that, as other speakers have alluded to before now, technology um, is a really important linchpin in the creation of race. Not only real technology, but also faux technology. One of the interesting things in Robert V. Guthrie's wonderful book, which I highly recommend, is called Even the Rat Was White. It's history of psychology from the point of view of African Americans. And he said that psychologists suffer from physics envy. envy. They want it to be seen as a hard science. So from the beginning, they've, they've adopted tools, preferably in brass, <laughs> and other, te other um, technological um, you know, elements that <coughs> hearken to those of physics in order to look like a hard science. The measurement, the physics, et cetera. This is a body of knowledge that is not terribly compelling um, scientifically or logically, but very compelling when it comes to the imaginations of people and the desire of people to see this as hard science rather than as the embodiment of bias. And I often speak about the American School of Ethnology beginning in the 16th century, right through the 19th century. These were the scientists who told the world who African Americans were. And one of the basic things about African Americans they felt the world needed to know is how unintelligent African Americans were. And um, they all agreed upon this. They thought they, 
they thought black people might not be part of the same species, but they were sure that even if they were, their intelligence was low and could never be elevated to that of a white person. So again, very early belief, data free, that has persisted until the present day. In fact, we had a really interesting episode in 1840. 1840 was an interesting year in that people don't realize it, but slavery was on life support. In Virginia, the legislature came within eight votes of, of abolishing slavery. And there was anti-slavery sentiment, was burgeoning, and the North was callously, Machiavelli, um, taking advantage of this because they, um, they, I don't know how much they cared about freeing enslaved people, but they certainly did resented the power that all these black bodies were giving the South and the legislature. So, how to protect enslavement? You know, the line had been for a long time that Southern whites needed enslavement. They depended on the um, non-diversified um, agrarian economy, depended on free labor. But now the argument changed to now it's African Americans who need enslavement. They can't survive without it. John C. Calhoun had been a medical student. He was Secretary of State, and he appointed a close friend to run the census, and for the first time they looked at African Americans and whites, but they divided African Americans into black and enslaved. And when the data of the census were printed, they found that free African Americans were 11 times more likely than enslaved ones to be insane. So enslavement was necessary for the health, mental health of African Americans. And you had Southern doctors lining up to say, we've been telling you for years these blacks can't survive on their own. Now will you believe me? Because after all, it was census data. We're not talking about the screed of some rabid you know, segregationists. We're talking about the US census. And um, the person who refuted it was the first man to earn a medical degree who was African American. He didn't earn it here because no one would accept him. He was um, denied admission on, on nakedly race, ra racial bars. He went to Glasgow, Scotland to medical school where he was a valedictorian. And he also took a degree in statistics. He was a perfect person to refute the census data. When he came back to the US, it's exactly what he did. He went to the Senate floor and issued a memorial, point by point refuting all these data. Some of the data were like frankly um, false. And for example, there was one insane asylum in Massachusetts that listed 133 insane black people. But he found that there was 133 white people. So that was on that level of a falsification. Unfortunately though, if you look at the medical literature, you can still find medical papers citing census data 50 years later as if it had never been refuted by McCune Smith. So an early lesson in the persistence of data uh, that are flawed, but speak to a racial bias, a favorite, a cherished racial bias. And there are a number of books that had been written um, in the past, very good books. This one I mentioned already, Stephen Jay Gould's Mis Measure of Man. He also talked about the data that were being collected uh, that were falsified and rigged in order to show that African Americans had lower intelligence than whites. And more frequently, more recently, we've had some excellent books that look at um, Current data, current data. So one of the problems, one of the ways we've gone wrong here is that in looking at IQ and looking at IQ, we've been data, we've been focused on genetics. The assumption, which has never been proven, that IQ is driven by genetics is something that um, frankly does not stand up well to scrutiny because there have never been a single gene found. Many, many genes found that alleged to be um, implied in intelligence. But first of all, if you can't define an entity, how are you going to establish causation? It's not compelling. And we have chosen not to look at compelling data. For example, infection. Uh, one of the things that we tend not to look at, or I think pay enough attention to, is copious data showing that infection, infectious disease, are closely correlated with intelligence. It's not surprising this should be so. Many infectious diseases attack the brain directly. Um, others cause fevers that cause collateral damage. And others um, lower intelligence simply by harming the brain of fet fetuses and newborns. A newborn child devotes 86% of its metabolic energy to building a brain, a complex brain. If a newborn child is infected, which is the case with most children, 
and Africa and part of the global south. Fighting off this infection and building the brain, both metabolically costly tasks, baby can't do both. That baby's brain will be damaged. It'll be flawed. The baby might have had the genetic potential of a genius or an Einstein, but he's likely to be born with a deficit. And uh, it's important to understand that genetic potential is just that, potential. Environment trumps it at every turn. This is a very good example. There are many more. In this country, um, I'll hear a few, a few charts. It's an article I wrote for the American Scholar about neglected tropical diseases and how they are um, damaging the cognitive abilities of kids in the global south and adults. And here's a book I wrote about how microbes and our microbiomes affect our mental health. So something that I think deserves much more scrutiny. And currently, I'm, I've actually just completed a book that looks at environmental toxins, toxicants, heavy metals, even microbes, um, pesticides, PCBs. These have profound, these cause profound injury to the brains of human beings and particularly children, particularly fetuses, for the same reason that infection will cause their brain not to reach its potential. Exposure to these toxins and toxicants, especially early on, will do so. But even adult brains are not free from, so we all know this, but likely researchers have been quantifying it in very useful ways. For example, we now know that exposure to lead in this country results in the loss of 23 million IQ points per cohort every year. That's a lot of IQ points. <laughs> and who's being most profoundly affected? People of color. These are the people who live near these um, toxic spilling, coal-fired plants that, that you know, spew mercury, lead, arsenic, other heavy metals. Um, so these are the people who are the most heavily affected. I'm not implying that it's only toxic exposures alone. But environment is a, is a vastly under, underappreciated a component of cognitive damage. And this is what's driving differences in IQ, in my opinion. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go into a lot more detail. There's more to say, but not more time. But I will say that um, although IQ is a deeply flawed metric, it is useful for something. One thing it's very useful for is assessing one's achievement. It doesn't actually measure potential, the way Hredder would like us to believe, but it does measure um, achievement. And so looking at who is able to do achieve certain um, important tasks in the West, like be, be literate, for example, be able to count well, uh, to do analyses. Um, who's able to do that does give us a meaningful um, metric for looking at whose brain has been damaged. And the racial na nature is very important too, because although very often described as socioeconomic exposure, in fact, Flint, the first two years, was described as a region where poor people lived. Only after two years did they say, say okay, they're primarily African Americans. We are living in a country, a, a nation of flints. And across our nature is, is poor people of color who are the worst harm, but also middle, uh, middle class people of color. And um, for example, African Americans who earn $60,000 a year are more heavily exposed to toxicants than white people who earn $10,000 a year. So although poverty puts you at risk, race puts you at higher risk. And um, I think that I'll wind up here. Thanks so much for listening to me. Thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. So I'll tell you about a thread of work that I've been doing with a lot of collaborators over the last two or three years, thinking about how language and text and stereotypes in language and text affect algorithms, and how can we use algorithms to study stereotypes in humans. 
So it's a, it's a collaboration with, uh, and based on discussions with a lot of people um, from computer science, also from the social sciences, including many of the folks here in this room. So I am a machine learning researcher. Right? So we work on a lot of different types of data, including genomics data, image data. Um, and what I find the most interesting about text data, especially for this context, right, is that the text data is actually really fundamental and it's really at the root for a lot of the algorithms that we develop. Right? So if you think about the, the kinds of interactions you have with your phone, with your computer, and soon to be with uh, you know, self-driving cars, right? a lot of that is actually through language and through text. So it's really sort of the fuel and the roots of many of the, of the machine learning algorithms and developments. So the other thing that's interesting about text, um, especially think for thinking about stereotypes and bias, is that when we interact uh, with the algorithms, oftentimes humans interact with algorithms through language, through text. Right? When you talk to your phone, you're actually verbally communicating with it, or if you're typing onto the chat bot, right, you're sending in text. Right? So to the extent that uh, the algorithms are continuously being trained, retrained, uh, and updated based on, this, based on this information, based on new data, there's actually sort of a closed loop of updating to these algorithms. So the other thing that's interesting about text is that um, it's actually quite different from prediction, from classification. Right? So earlier today, we heard a lot of interesting talks about what are the biases and challenges for thinking about inequalities right, in prediction and classification. So to some extent, text actually happens upstream of that. Right? So text is often a way to generate features. And then those features are fed into the specific prediction algorithms you know, for uh, biomedical applications or for different recommendation systems. Right? But before you make the predictions, you first have to have representations and features of your data. And what we want to focus on today is even before you get to the prediction part, which may already be too late, right? so how do the different stereotypes creep in even in the featureization and the representations of your data? Right. So the kinds of challenges and techniques we'll look at here is also quite different from predictions. In predictions, for example, you've heard from Sandil's nice talk about you have different risk scores. You can do calibration. Here, it's actually, in some sense, much more unsupervised. Right? So we don't have very specific objectives, um, so which presents other challenges. So, um, so for the talk today, I want to tell you about sort of two threads of work. So sort of a slightly earlier thread of work is how do we think about how human stereotypes in language and text sort of creep into and affect algorithms through these representations. And more recent thread of work, which we're also interested in, is how can we actually leverage the fact that algorithms are actually quite good at capturing these biases as a way to turn the problem around, right? So make these algorithms as a mirror to study our own uh, stereotypes and our own biases, especially in settings where it's hard to quantify otherwise. Right, so, so the first problem is more of how can these uh, issues affect computer science? And the second framework is how can we actually use these tools for computer science to study social questions? And I think they're quite complementary. OK, cool. So since we have a quite diverse audience here, so I want to just give you a one minute primer so that you're all experts uh, on how these algorithms represent these kinds of data. So let's say if you're actually trying to build various applications, right? So maybe predictions or some natural language systems, and you are starting with text data, with training data. Right? So usually a sort of an intermediate step or an initial step of how this all works is that you first basically map your words into vectors. Right? So these are basically embeddings or dictionaries, you can think of them, or featureizations of your words. Right? So the idea here is that if somehow the geometries between the vectors, right? captures the semantic relations between the corresponding English words, then you have now a new representation, new featureization. In other words, that makes it easier to comprehend by the downstream prediction algorithms. Right, so every English word, you know, like Simons or Berkeley or dog and cat, is now mapped into its own vector. And you can think of them as being some sort of geometries between these vectors. OK. So people in text and especially in natural language processing, part of computer science have developed a lot of ways to study how good are these representations. Right. So a common kind of approach is to basically give these representations it's little puzzles to solve and see how well can it solve these puzzles. Right. So standard kind of puzzles are, for example, what you might have taken in SATs right, from high school to solve these analogy puzzles. Like man is the king, is woman is too blank, and then you fill in like, then these Algorithm will say, okay, so the 
the theta now gets to one minus two queen, right? And then gets a you know a good score. So um, so starting from about three years ago, so what we wanted to do is to first can we design a set of uh, puzzles to really quantify what are the potential stereotypes in these word representations, right? Because despite the fact that these algorithms and these representations have been now been used in many, many applications, so both academic and industry applications, people actually haven't quite carefully checked right, systematically what are the potential human stereotypes that shows up in these representations. Right. And we think that has been quite a fundamental step if we want to understand what are the biases in all of these downstream app prediction problems. So we basically designed a bunch of uh, probes um, and you know, I think since you have been very uh, sort of rather passive audience for the last hour, so I want to make this more interactive, right? So, so each of this is basically one of the puzzles that we give to the standard embedding algorithms, and I will let each of you to uh, predict what you think the algorithm returns as uh, as its answer. So, um, we we'll start with the easy one. Brother, okay. Good. Without blue. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you wish. Oh, okay. What about doctor? Nurse. Architect. Interior designer. Oh, someone said interior designer. Okay. Good. Um, good guess. Yeah. So, what about realist? This is a harder one. Streamer. Streamer. Pessimist. Optimist. Okay. <laughs> um, so some interesting insights. Um, you can also flip this around. I right? can ask. Okay, so she is to pregnancy is he is to cancer. <laughs> okay, okay. Fatherhood. Fatherhood. Okay, maybe that would be natural. Uh, uh, when I presented this to actually to um, some physicians, yeah. so one of the physicians came up and said that this is the analogy that the physician actually explains. Yeah. To explain pain. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. To, to explain pain to the wife. Yeah. I have a friend, when his wife went into labor, he developed immediately a kidney stone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have one question, but is, is this sort of culturally gendered already? So if, you have, if we lived in a country where more of the doctors were women, would we all have said nurse? So that's a good question. So, so this is actually algorithms, embedding algorithms that are trained on data sets. Uh, so we tried this on data sets. Uh, most of the data actually come from the US. So if you actually train this, and other people have tried training this on data from other countries, um, and sometimes, they, oftentimes, actually, they observe similar results. Right? But there are some interesting differences. So um, is this vulnerable to the, uh, there was a paper that was posted at NACL, or maybe it was ACL this year, that showed that a lot of these analogies that A is to B is C is to D, um, should turn out that way because everyone's using eval code, the original word to vec eval code, which doesn't allow you to return B. Yes, yeah, so are you using yeah. that code? No, so, so this or is... He is the doctor, as she is the doctor, or it, is doctor systematically excluded, so it has to yes, say... Yes, just to be clarified, so there's no exclusion here, right? So we use a different analogy algorithm that actually allowed you to, to return um, any word. So, right? so for example, doctor would be allowed here, so it actually does show up, but it just actually shows up after nurse, right? And after uh, midwife and after a few other things. You actually get vectors of... These things that you're saying after. So like, yeah, yeah, so we actually have a, so the returns, you basically have a ranking of these, right? So doctor shows up, it's, it is allowed, so there's no exclusion, so it is allowed, and the doctor just shows up after. About the different languages, have you tried it in languages where there's a difference between female and male? You know, like in, in Hebrew, for example, you use different, even descriptive uh, terms, like, like wise or. Yeah. So, so, we have, uh, so maybe I'll come back to that at the end, if that's, uh, because I think there's a more, more intricate discussion we need to have about different languages here. Okay, good. Um, okay, so, so the last one is, okay, so when we do, you know, computer programmer, so as a probe, right, so these analogies would say that's analogous to homemaker, right? Um, again, it is allowed to return computer programmer, but it actually just chose homemaker 
as it thinks is for the more appropriate analogy. Um, so, so this is actually just an illustration, right? So of these, in, in the representations, in the featureization itself, there's already a lot of human stereotypes, gender stereotypes, and also ethnic and other cultural stereotypes that we can show actually are built into these analogies, into, into the representations. Um, and we actually have systematically verified this now um, you know, through quite a pretty large scale citizen science, where we essentially automatically generate these analogies. And for each of those, actually give it to a lot of people to basically evaluate, does, it, does those analogies agree with their own perceptions of what are problematic gender stereotypes? Right? Just to see that they do actually, that the biases in embedding this match up quite uh, accurately with human stereotypes. So and the reason why I want to emphasize why we think that this is, this is being quite problematic is that, again, these featureizations is really one of the first steps you do. Right? So if you do any other predictions on top of this, this is somehow you know, analogous to teaching children uh, try to do more complicated things when you, the dictionary like, you know, that you give them in the, in the very beginning to teach them what are the meanings of words already have these stereotypes that are baked into it. Um, and we and others have shown that for a lot of the downstream applications for both predictions and actually things in deployment, these kinds of biases, stereotypes in the representation can lead to um, unintended and sometimes harmful consequences. Um, so, okay, so, so what do we do with this, right? So I think this is actually quite a, a complex uh, and nuanced question because there are some applications where you think that having these kinds of stereotypes built into representation, into featureization might be useful. If you are, for example, trying to build recommendation systems for clothing, maybe you do want to have the gender stereotypes built in. But in other applications, if you're trying to build these systems for ranking of you know, college applicants or resumes, you want to be much more careful about any of these potential stereotypes. So, so there's, I think, a lot of really healthy and interesting discussions about how do we, what are, what, what are the settings when this is appropriate or inappropriate, and what do we do with this? But I think in all of these settings, what is useful is to actually be able to perform kind of contrafactual analysis. Right, so what I mean by that is that, now if you have your machine learning pipeline, right, maybe it's making predictions or rankings, and it's taking in these text features, these text representations is one of the features, right. it will be useful to know how does your pipeline actually change if you keep everything else the same, keep the pipeline the same, but just change the text representation to reduce some of these gender stereotypes or ethnic stereotypes. Right? Think of that as sort of a perturbation or sensitivity analysis to see how sensitive is your machine learning complex AI prediction results based on this particular representation that's using these gender stereotype information. Okay. And you, then you can decide whether this is appropriate or not, but this is useful information just for full transparency. So this was actually the motivation for our initial work, which is try to come up ways to basically create, to do this kind of counterfactual analysis by creating these kind of uh, reduced the sort of new representations with less bias. The technical details are, are less important. I just want to give you the high level intuition how, how we take a step to doing that. All right, so the idea here is that if you remember each English word now is mapped onto a vector, where the geometry of the vector is somehow important. So what we did is that we actually found that there's actually some, like a fairly low dimensional subspace that corresponds to gender stereotypes. There's a, quite a deep reason why that happens, but it, it, does, it does exist empirically. And then essentially what we do is to basically take words that does not really have dictionary definition of gender into, built into it, basically just re project away the contribution from this gender subspace. So the actual algorithm is a little bit more complicated, but that's the high level idea. And by doing this, we can actually show that, okay, so now you actually produce, again, through cross-sourcing experiments, citizen science experiments, you can generate sort of an embedding algorithm now that has less bias. And that's actually how we can validate, and our uh, collaborators, uh, some co-authors validated, that um, it is actually this gender information that led to some of the biases in downstream applications, such as sort of entity recognition, which is our standard NLP task. Yeah, and actually, in this case, the counterfactual analysis shows that if you can actually, if you reduce the stereotypes in the text representation, you can actually improve the performance for this downstream natural language processing task. Yes. 
just a quick question. Um, how did you stop it going, he king, she king? You didn't. We didn't. I, I know you didn't. I'm asking you how you managed to get it to go doctor, doctor, but not king, king. No. Oh, okay, good. So, um, so what I skimmed over is that when we actually do this, uh, projection to reduce the bias, right? So we first essentially learn a classifier to figure out which words should be corrected because they should be really gender neutral and which words has gender built into its definition and hence should not be changed, right? So in this case, um, these words, like for example, occupational words, we think really should be gender neutral are the ones that we actually do the correction and words like king and queen or he and she that you know, if you actually look at the dictionary definition, has gender built into it, we do not change. All right, so maybe that's a little, yes, so that's, that's how we do it. So there are, um, so I think this, this is basically really a first step, right? Uh, and since then, there's been a lot of uh, improvements on these kinds of methods to reduce this bias. Um, and, right, and, and I just want to make a quick comment that Reducing the bias itself, I think it's also quite challenging and can be uh, undesirable in many applications, right? So, um, so for example, I mean, there's a lot of great discussions earlier today about thinking, taking into account the broader social context. Essentially, what we're doing here is a very agnostic algorithm that just simply, you know, training some classifier to say what words should and should not be gender neutral and doing these numerical operations, right? That's really not taking into account the broader context. So that's something that I think we, as a community, should do much better on trying to improve these, uh, into these algorithms. So the second aspect of the talk I want to more quickly go through is now that we've shown that these algorithms, these embeddings or representations are so effective at capturing human stereotypes, can we actually turn this problem around and use these algorithms as a mirror to study our own stereotypes, especially in settings where maybe we have implicit biases, implicit stereotypes that are hard to quantify otherwise. So one setting where it's actually very hard to quantify what are the implicit stereotypes and human biases is actually on historical data. Right. So it's hard to go back into past and conduct surveys or conduct experiments. So one thing we did was basically actually take Google Books right, over the last 100 years and we have all this those text data. Now we can basically do the same idea as I showed you before. At each time period, since you train these representations, train these visualizations, and then just see how does the embeddings actually evolve over the last 100 years, right? And see, can we actually use how the embeddings have been changing over the last 100 years as a way to study how has human stereotypes and for gender and, and uh, gender ethnic stereotypes, how has that changed and evolved over the last 100 years? So this is basically more like as a lens to study social science. Um, and I'll just quickly show you a few highlights of the results. Much more of the results are in the paper that we published uh, last year. So one thing that's of great personal interest is, is to study how has stereotypes in the US towards Asian Americans, how has that changed over the last 100 years? It's something that a lot of people talked about, but actually has not been a lot of systematic quantifications of it. So here I'm showing you using similar techniques from the first part of the talk, right? What are the adjectives from each of these time periods that are the most associated with Chinese Americans, right? From 1910, 1950, and 1990, the top 10 adjectives, right? And this is actually something that's already quite striking, now also um, striking to us, right? So in 1910, you have adjectives like barbaric, envious, or monstrous, hateful, right? Very much framings of outsiders uh, or aliens even, right? So that's actually started to change a lot after World War II, 1950s, and by 1990, it actually changed quite completely into framings about, you know, sensitive or inhibited, so much more of stereotypes about sort of model minorities. Right? So I think there are certainly complex issues with all these different stereotypes, especially now as it pertains to college admissions, um, but certainly it's interesting to be able to quantify this and see how they have been involved over time. So the other thing that's interesting is that we have this text data, but we also have a lot of data from the social sciences, from, for example, from the US Census. For example, we can see, again, across each of these time periods, right, how has the actual uh, various 
occupation participations by Chinese Americans in different occupations, how did that actually evolve over time? And how did that change with the matchup with the stereotypes towards Asian Americans uh, in the same time period? Right, so basically, uh, just to summarize this, like the, the green curve here actually shows you essentially the, the occupational bias from the US census, whereas the blue one corresponds to basically the embedding bias from the text data. So you can see that they actually track quite closely. The bias becomes greater right around World War II, right? Um, and then uh, it became sort of became more neutral after that. And another thing that this allows us to do is to uh, quantify what are potentially some of the legislations that might be correlated or it might even be causal in a ways to change these stereotypes. So here it's a little bit complex plot, but the high level idea here is that basically we can, since we have the embedding at each time period, we can see how does the embedding correlate through its nearby time period right, as a way to see how fast is it changing. So this is basically like a correlation map of how fast these embeddings or how fast the stereotypes are changing across time based on the text data. And you can essentially see a couple of sort of fairly uh, striking phase transitions where uh, around 19, 1950, 1960, there's a quite a rapid change in the stereotypes in the text data. And that actually corresponds to the, the passage of 1965 of the Immigration Nationalization Act, which actually made it much easier for Asians to, uh, you know, to become naturalized US citizens and to come to the US. And we've done similar kinds of analysis uh, you know, for, for different ethnic groups, also for gender. All right, so here are also some of the top adjectives uh, across the last 100 years, across different time periods. You can also see sort of interesting changes. Uh, and also there's, the, I guess, the most striking kind of phase transitions, as you would expect, around 1960s, uh, where we really see the text and the stereotypes really quite changed a lot from pre to after 1960s. So this is what we've done for historical data because that's an area where it's very hard to quantify um, you know, these stereotypes, right? but where we think these kinds of text analysis could be useful. Yes? So the Asian population in 1910 is not the Asian population of 1990, in that most of the Asians in 1910 would have been Chinese. I think, am I might be misremembering the population. Um, so, so there's also a lot of Japanese populations. Yeah. A lot of Jap Chinese and Japanese. And then 1990 is much bigger, uh, much more. Right. Mm -hmm. right. right. So we actually stratify this for specifically for Chinese, right? Uh, we can do this based on the Chinese names and also for each of the other groups. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So just very lastly to wrap up, then here's another app because there's a lot of interest for the biomedical applications from the earlier session today. So we also did this. Uh, very quickly for biomedical data. So basically we had reviews of physicians from large hospital system for all the reviews from the last few, uh, like five years, right? Uh, basically for each review, the patient would give a rating for the physician you know, from uh, one to 10, and also would write uh, a report, like the summary, like a feedback for the physician. Right, so basically we can do the kinds of analysis where condition and correcting for the ratings, right? For all the reviews, all the patients that give high ratings to these physicians, what are the differences and why did the patient actually give a high rating to the male or to the female, patient, to the female clinician or to physicians from different ethnic groups? Right. And you can see actually quite interestingly that the, the main sort of rationale that we can detect from analysis for why high ratings for female physicians are really related to sort of this you know, attentive, uh, warm, friendly, uh, kind of nice feelings, whereas the, the rationales why given to high male physician ratings are more related to you know, intelligence, accurate, expert. Um, so you can see that there's already quite a bit of differences in how people talk about these physicians, even given the same scores. And this is important because this review, right? And so these, these reviews are actually considered by the hospitals when they give, uh, you know, think about, uh, salaries for these physicians. Uh, so I think I'm out of time, just, just to very quickly wrap up. Right? So, so when we think about the transparency problem of, of these biases in the algorithms, I think it's really important to start from the very beginning uh, to look at the data and also look at the representations and featureizations of your data even before we get into the predictions uh, and the issues there. Right? Because this is really getting closer to the root of these problems. Uh, and to do this is actually extremely important for you know, computer scientists like us to really engage 
with all the social scientists and humanists and legal scholars. And also presents, it's not all bad news, right? it also presents an interesting opportunity to create new lens and new tools to study interesting social science problems. Let's take a 10 minute break and then come back and have our panel discussion.